The federal government says Twitter and its founder, Jack Dorsey, are responsible for the losses the country suffered during the NSAS protest. Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, in an interview with state broadcaster Radio Nigeria, is alleging that the Twitter boss raised funds through Bitcoin to sponsor NSAS protest while his platform was used to fuel the crisis. He said when the allegations were made earlier, Nigerians did not take him seriously until an online media outfit carried out an investigation and fact-checking. According to the minister, the online publication confirmed that Jack Dorsey retweeted some of the posts by some of the coalition supporting the NSAS protest. It says it also verified that Twitter founder launched a fundraiser asking people to donate via Bitcoin. Mohammed added that Twitter consistently offered its platform to promote an agenda that is inimical to the corporate existence of Nigeria. Tundu. This is actually quite a complicated issue, mm. I have to say. And um, there is some logic. I see the logic in where Elijah Muhammad is coming from and the argument that he's advancing of what liability, what responsibility a platform owes to those who use it and owes to the society. We are you know, operating our own platform. So we also know our limitations. And I think that Jack Dorsey would do well to not just dismiss this in the manner that him, Mark Zuckerberg, and other social media giants tried to dismiss the allegations made against them back in 2013. That why is it that in the name of objectivity and freedom of speech, why do you allow your platform to be used to propagate ISIS propaganda? ISIS was using Twitter and other social media platforms to radicalize people all over the world. And they were sort of taking a hands-off approach, saying it's just a platform we provide for anybody to do what they like. But eventually, about a year later, they had to start clamping down. So this also, I think, is instructive for Twitter. The, the power of a retweet, the power of a retweet to link you to all kinds of unfortunate incidents that had actually nothing to do with the peaceful protest. But so that's where that ends. To so the rest of the point, I will say Jack Dorsey cannot be blamed for the mayhem, the pandemonium that happened as a result of the aftermath of the NSAS protest. That has nothing to do with Jack Dorsey. So similar, it has nothing to do with those peaceful protesters who took the, to the streets fighting against police brutality. To make that link is, in, is disingenuous. It was a peaceful protest. Who let the hoodlums out to play in the first case, to quell those protests? And those hoodlums could now not be controlled. Who actually escalated things to the point where people were allegedly shot on Leki Ikoyi Bridge on the 20th of October? And so today we have no you know, firm answers. Who escalated it to that extent? That is what created the environment for the kind of looting, the kind of wanton destruction, the murders of police officers that we saw then. So it was not the youths that were protesting um, police brutality and just fighting for their right to live. It was actually the politicians who introduced hoodlums who should be blamed for that. But for Jack Dorsey as a businessman, he should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. He needs to take a cue from this and perhaps sit on the fence a bit more when it comes to protest so that if things go left, you're not a fall guy. You're not a scapegoat for the actions of other people, which we can all see. We all remember that, you know, that period. Our eyes covered this extensively. There was footage of people coming out of trucks being sponsored by certain elements who till now have not been identified. So it's easy, it's convenient to make Jack, Jack Dorsey the fall guy. And we all owe it to ourselves that we don't make ourselves convenient scapegoats. Okay, <clears throat> what is uh, Elijah Lai Mohammed's main point? His main point is that this has nothing, you know, the uh, push against Twitter is not just about uh, President Mohammed Obuari's uh, tweet and that consistently over time, the Nigerian government had been monitoring the activities of Twitter in Nigeria. And at, at some point come to the conclusion that Twitter, you know, uh, was, uh, you know, undermining the sovereignty of Nigeria and promoting activities and opinions uh, that are inimical to the uh, uh, corporate existence of the country. Alajilai Mohammed made the point that they have proof that a particular separatist promoter had turned uh, Twitter into its uh, main platform, its main platform, and that Twitter did not see anything wrong in this regard. And to worsen matters, during the NSAS protests, Alaji uh, Lai Mohammed, Minister of Information of Nigeria, argues that Jack Dorsey personally raised funds 
Bitcoin, through Bitcoin, uh, for the NSAS protest. He argues that he, uh, Jack Dorsey personally also created an emoji which promoted the objectives of the, uh, of the uh, NSAS protesters uh, in Nigeria. And that the evidence they have is that Jack Dorsey also encouraged other people to contribute money to the protests against the Nigerian government in October 2020. And that on the basis of this, uh, the Nigerian government considers uh, Jack Dorsey, Vicario State liable, and also his platform, also liable for the damages that occurred to Nigeria during the October 2020 protests, which resulted into the destruction of about 156 police vehicles, about 154 uh, uh, facilities across Nigeria, and the destruction of 200 brand new buses in Lagos, and the destruction also of over 200 uh, business units belonging to innocent uh, Nigerians. Mm. And that what happened at that time was that, uh, you know, uh, Twitter uh, fueled a crisis mm. in Nigeria. Uh, Lajilai Mohammed was very detailed in outlining the extent of that vicarious liability. I think on this occasion, he, he, he suddenly remembered that uh, he studied law and he was uh, using legal terms and trying to provide, uh, you know, uh, useful documentary and physical uh, evidence. Now, what is the situation? What it is clear is that the, the Nigerian government did not just wake up against Twitter. They had been plotting and monitoring uh, Twitter, and they had been waiting. The Nigerian government had been waiting for an auspicious moment. Don't forget that in 2020, October 20, uh, 2020, one Garuba Adams, I think that's his name, you know, he went to court. A, a former Garuba Adamu, a former presidential uh, aspirant, went to court to sue Jack Dorsey for $1 billion, accusing him of damages against Nigeria, using his platform against Nigeria. Well, of course, when the case uh, was called in court, uh, you know, Adamu did not show up, his lawyer did not show up, he eventually withdrew from that case. But here we are. But I think the other point to note is that uh, Lai Mohammed says that uh, Twitter has now written officially to the Nigerian government, asking for dialogue. And we must also note the fact that Twitter is in a difficult place. It has issues in India, where it has 700 million uh, followers. It has issues in Nigeria, where it has 40 million followers. Just as Twitter is, bounding, uh, is, uh, is um, bowing to political pressure in India, we, we're likely to see Twitter also bowing to political pressure in Nigeria. But what will be the fallout? Are we likely to see other countries also say, well, what we don't want in our country, Twitter must not publish. That's censorship. Simplicity. So the end of it all is that the Nigerian government wants to censor uh, Twitter. But will Twitter bow to political pressure and allow countries to change its rules according to their own national laws? Well, that's where the big challenge is. Thank you so much, Dr. Bati Antundu. And that's all on News and We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus, Michael, uh, Adesua, Aaron, uh, and the rest of the team, you know, uh, to give us Africa global business, COVID 19 spot and activities across the globe. Just stay with us. Welcome back to Morning Show here on Arise News. Our dependable Rotis Adiri is here to give us an African business update. Over to you, Rotis. African business update focuses on the Nigeria development update, which came from the World Bank. From the World Bank. It was released uh, yesterday, uh, same day as the inflation figures uh, came out. One of the key takeaways from that report, according to the World Bank, they estimate that 7 million Nigerians fell into poverty in 2020 due to increase of prices uh, in, in, in the basket, the food basket and so on and so forth. 60% of inflation driven by uh, food. Now, we had an exclusive interview uh, with the World Bank country director, Shubham Chaduri, and also the lead economist at the World Bank, Marco Hernandez, on a rise exchange yesterday evening. I want you to listen to uh, Shubham Chaduri talking specifically about remove, um, redirecting expenditure towards more impactful areas. And he talked about removing subsidies. Let's take a listen to the World Bank director for Nigeria. Priority number two on the fiscal side is to redirect expenditures from expenditures that only benefit a few to expenditures that will benefit the many, and in particular, the poor, who are about half of the population. Now, what's the number one priority for redirecting expenditures? PMS subsidies. 
PMS subsidies are about 100 billion naira a month right now, given the price of oil. And if the price of oil continues to go up, PMS, the, the 100 billion naira will also grow. And this is 100 billion naira that could be coming into the Federation account and then be redirected towards name your you know, favorite cause. Could be primary health care, could be basic education, could be a rural road. But that's not coming in right now. And these subsidies are benefiting largely a small segment of the population at the top. And so these are the kinds of fiscal choices. And electricity tariffs would be another one. Uh, the cost of you know, re re having electricity tariffs remain below what it costs to provide the power. Uh, so these are the choices on the fiscal side that I think the government is very aware of and took some bold moves, steps on in 2020. We are very hopeful uh, that on this front that we will see further progress and that that trade-off, and essentially it's a social, it's a contract to take the fiscal resources that are being used on these kinds of subsidies, redirecting them towards pro-poor expenditures that benefit the many. All right, so that was uh, Shubham Chaduri there, World Bank Country Director. Now, remember his emphasis on the poor. Let's now take a listen to Marco Hernandez, lead economist at the World Bank, talking about prioritizing inflation on the monetary side. So we believe that the immediate priority is to reduce inflation and to do so in a way that it promotes uh, economic growth going forward so that the recovery continues at the same time that we protect the poor. There, there are millions of Nigerians right now that are living in poverty or very close to the poverty line and they're being heavily affected by what's happening on inflation. So that is the immediate priority. I want to commend the central bank for the recent move that they have on the unification of exchange rate. They have adopted the NAFEX rate, which is the rate at the investor and exporters window as their anchor rate. This is, very, this is very important and we believe that it would help to boost the competitiveness of the economy and also it will help to reduce inflation. Um, but at the same time, we do see an opportunity to keep going forward, not only on the monetary side, but across all policy areas. All right, so speaking of those inflation figures, uh, let's take a look at them. It's, well, we saw another de deceleration. said this yesterday, I didn't expect inflation to, to, to keep climbing, but I expected it to stay within the 18% range. Uh, you should have headline inflation figures there. 17.93% uh, for May compared to year on year, compared to 18.12% from the prior month in April. Food inflation still above 22%, still above 20%, 22.8% from 22.72. Uh, core inflation, you notice that, you know, which strip shop core, um, volatile agricultural produce from the basket that increased to 13.15 percent from 12.74 now let's look at month on month because you'll notice that if we move to month on month inflation you will see an increase across the board month on month inflation headline 1.01 percent from 0.97 percent in april food inflation 1.05 percent from 0.99 core inflation 1.24 so what you've seen here, I think, is with what I've been speaking to analysts, it's a base effect. If your year on year inflation, year on year is decelerating, but month on month is still climbing upwards, you can probably say that it's the, it's the high base effect from the prior year. We're seeing that starting to peter out. But still, as I said yesterday, as those in our exclusive interview with the World Bank executives there, the country director and lead economist, it is still very high. Seven million estimated Nigerians fell into poverty. Mind you, the president in his Democracy Day address, I don't know where he got those figures from, said that in the last two years, Nigeria pulled out 10.5 million people out of poverty. And he still has this overarching goal where he's got two more years or less than two years in office and he wants to pull 100 million people out of poverty. With inflation figures like that, the World Bank really pushing, emphasizing on poor Nigerians and how to redirect funds to, us, to get them out of poverty. That's their main drive here. Reform is what they're looking for a part of that interview that I found completely staggering. Uh, Mr. Hernandez talked about how inflation has been rising since 2019 when the government closed its borders. A year ago, you could get with 1,000 naira, six kilograms of maize. Today, it's only four kilograms of maize. And then the real clincher. A year ago, six to seven percent of Nigerian households had one adult who had not eaten for an entire day, six to seven percent a year ago. Now it's 18 percent of Nigerian households contain one adult that has not had a meal for one whole day. I mean, if that's not <laughs> sobering, I don't know what is. I mean, and it's very well said, Tundu, because what it will do invariably is 
Once CPI, Consumer Price Index, you know, once it jumps up and price at which people get things increase, what happens? The knock-on effect on the lives of people is staggering. And at the same time, you have money that is losing its value every single day. Naira has become dead cheap today. Let's not deceive ourselves. And that's the irony of things. So money, it's losing its value. It's harder to get jobs. A lot of people are being thrown into unemployment. Then the price of food is increasing at the same time. And Rotus, I mean, you studied economics. You go back to the old theory of Phillips Cove. Obviously, when you have a place where there's high unemployment rate, what happens? Wage will reduce. And that is what is happening. So these are the things people Correct. constantly talk about. Well, Every time. The government should do something about this. On the interview with the World Bank chiefs in Nigeria, I think that uh, uh, both the country director and the country rep are just consistent in terms of the terms of the $1.5 billion loan that we took uh, from the World Bank. Uh, you recall that at the time, that the approval of that loan was uh, a bit delayed, and the objective was to use it uh, to help Nigeria with COVID-19 and to provide, provide their budget support. And the points made by the two gentlemen in the interview with uh, Bufsin uh, Omofai, you know, they, they repeated originally the same points. The removal of subsidy, the unification of the exchange rate, and also the point about electricity tariffs. So there is nothing that they have said that is new. For me, what is more important in their report and in the conversation is the point that they made about resilience through reforms. The emphasis of the Bretton Woods uh, institutions is about reforms. Nigeria showing a commitment to reforms. And the country director made a point about elite consensus about how to move Nigeria forward. Is there such an elite consensus in this country? That's the question we should ask, because Nigerians have different opinions well, about it is the monetary policy, about fiscal policy. We have other issues that have divided the country in such a manner that you don't have an elite class with an enlightened interest that is centered around the interests of the people of Nigeria. Now, we talk all the time about a people-oriented uh, uh, people CBN, Central Bank of Nigeria. But that people orientation of the Central Bank of Nigeria how is it aligned with some of these monetary policy uh, priorities? So there's some kind of disjunction. And that is why I think that the uh, country director made a good point when he raised that issue about elite consensus and about how to move Nigeria forward. But don't forget also that the World Bank defined what should be done with the loan. Are we doing exactly what should be done uh, with that loan? And are we getting the results, given the security issues, given the uh, confusion? within the Nigerian environment. Well, thank you, Rotis. Moving on to more business updates, Michael Wilson joins thank us you. now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Morning. Uh, everything really in holding pattern. I think that's the way to describe it ahead of the FOMC uh, meeting and, and decisions that we're going to hear about um, later, later on today. Oils continued to climb. I'll come on to that detail uh, later on. So therefore, Asia markets really reflecting that sort of holding pattern, not doing um, a great deal. S&P finished 0.2% uh, lower. So that's kind of holdover from yesterday's markets is doing nothing really to, to encourage uh, anything in Asia markets at all. Nikkei, four Fallen 0.3 percent. Cosby. China markets are retreating again. The P. Uh, the public. The People's Bank of China uh, declined to reverse its liquidity decision. I.e., did not put any more money into the market. Uh, and it's got. There are clampdowns on the shadow banking uh, sector as well, which I'll come on to. Shanghai, therefore, down about 0.3 percent. Japan. A lot of exports from Japan, but not imports. That's I think the most important figure from them. So that's why I feel that those are relatively. Um, the, 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 that's that's the relatively important side of the figures. What Japan is actually importing, i.e., the growth of the domestic economy, which is something uh, which may get more help uh, on Friday when it may get some more pandemic relief injection. Uh, China uh, again, just sort of treading water as we speak. I said that it was clamping down on shadow banking. Um, I've heard this many, many times before. I'm sure you have too. Uh, given that a lot of this money gets funneled into property developers and the rest of it, what the what the, the authorities are now saying in China, and again they've tried this many, many times, is if you're going to save things, you put it in official assets, not into the shadow banking uh, sector. And also, it turns out that uh, crypto miners are leaving China for Texas. I 
throw that open just as a, a, a bit of news that's actually happening. Why Texas? I don't know. But somebody is going to say, just as they did in China, uh, hang on a second, you're using a lot of electricity electricity to mine this. Jack Ma, he of Alibaba, the founder, he's actually lying low. He's retired. We haven't heard from him since last year, really. But it turns out, you know, he had a bit of a rocky year, didn't he, with the Chinese? He's actually doing quite well. He's concentrating on philosophy and he's also brushing up his art skills. How nice is that? He's doing quite well. OK, so let's look at the United States then. Recap uh, on what happened there yesterday. Not a lot of stuff. Retail sales, PPI, industrial production didn't give the markets much to get their teeth into yesterday. We've got the FOMC meeting uh, coming up. Will the will the Fed look at inflation, which we continue to register, is rising as transitory, or will it start to do something? Will we hear about tapering uh, their bond buying programme and tapering the pandemic help that the central bank's been giving to the US economy. Don't know. We'll no doubt be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, US and the EU are very heavily signalled after the weekend. There's now a truce on the Boeing Airbus dispute. has been going on for 17 years. Yeah. Two sides agreed to respond tariffs for five years. Um, and both these companies have sort of cheered the deal because it's come at a good time for both. You know what Airbus is doing. We've reported on this before. Boeing, too. They're hoping to pick up on what when we all get back in aeroplanes again. When will that happen? Don't know yet. Uh, Biden meets Putin in Geneva. Joe Biden uh, meets the president of Russia uh, today. Um, what will they be talking about? Well, the US will have a long line of complaints to take to it, um, not, not least of which uh, cyber attacks, um, election meddling, crackdown on um, crackdown on, on various exports that the US has been doing. Uh, it's a win already for Putin. He's got Biden to the table. Nice photo opportunity. Doesn't really matter what they discuss. I don't suspect it'll be a great deal because the personal chemistry is absolutely zilch between the two of them. Uh, worst it's ever been between two leading uh, politicians of those two countries for a very long time. That's according to diplomatic sources. Not really my field, but no doubt Nick Jennings will be talking about that uh, later on. UK uh, and Australia have agreed that widely single trade deal, a free trade agreement, looking at cars, confectionery, scotch, whiskey. But most importantly, and this is the most important thing, we talked about this before, and um, obviously the UK are very keen to strike trade deals with the rest of the world post-Brexit, but the farmers are complaining about it. They see Australian imports as being highly competitive. Um, the government has said there'll be a cap on tariff-free imports from Australia for 15 years. Um, the, 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 the farmers' spokespeople um, counter this by saying that there's two people who are actually looking at the way that farm exports and imports work within the whole framework of, of the UK as compared with 15 in Australia. You know, they clearly regard it as something important. Uh, we don't. Inflation's come in very, very briefly and very quickly, 2.1% compared, this is year on year, uh, compared to 1.8 estimates. Fuel, eating out and clothes, a record rise in workers on payrolls. Will that be adding to pressure on the central bank, the Bank of England, to increase interest rates? Yes, of course it will. Will they? Probably not. They'll look through it in the same way that the US central bank will hear no doubt um, tomorrow when we look at those when we look at the, what they've actually done UK is tooling up for gigafactory talks for electric vehicles talking to the likes of LG Samsung and Ford none of those big companies has actually confirmed these uh, talks are actually taking place but a little one has called Britvolt and it's certainly saying that um, this is actually going to happen uh, though a green group has said that actually you know the war chest in in the UK is a it's a paltry paltry what are we to talk about poultry? £400 million. The EU is talking about billions when it comes to looking for investments and, and, and tax incentives to get electric vehicle batteries made within the EU. The UK is starting, but it's not. It's a long way behind. Oil markets note, actually increasing, continue note, to I'm rally. Afraid, Mr. Wilson, we're going to have to leave it here this morning. Oh, thank you so much for your time. Moving on to the Biden-Putin summit in Geneva, President Joe Biden arrived Tuesday in Switzerland for his first meeting as president with Russian President Vladimir Putin amid a decade of stark deterioration in relations between the two countries. We're now joined by AP correspondent Angela Charlton in Geneva for an update on this historic meeting. Hi, Angela. Hello. Hello. From the studio in Lagos. 
Yes, hello. Go hello, good morning. So how is it going uh, there in Geneva? We've been talking here about uh, the meeting between uh, President Biden and President Putin. What are the uh, issues that yes, we should look forward to, the key issues? Well, first of all, the fact that they're having this meeting at all is considered a major achievement. The relations between the U.S. and Russia are at an all-time low. That's one of the few things that Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden agree on. So the meeting will be more about their personal relations and trying to improve that than any major breakthroughs. There are, they are looking for some sort of common ground. So one of the issues is that neither country currently has their ambassador in place because they've had so many diplomatic problems over the last few months. So there is a possibility they could make an agreement to return their ambassadors. Of course, a much bigger issue that they might be able to find common ground on is arms control. Uh, these are two nuclear powers, and it's in no one's interest anywhere in the world for them to be in an open confrontation. But you mentioned the personal relationship being improved. What are the chances of that? When President Joe Biden referred to President Vladimir Putin as a killer, and also the fact that they're not dining together, is that an indication of, you know, a fraught relationship at the moment? Yes. <clears throat> Yes, the expectations are low. Both sides have said that very clearly. Um, and they've made a point of also not having a joint press conference. So we could get two very different versions of what's happening today. But they are having three meetings uh, for a total of up to four to five hours, which is a long time, including a small meeting and then larger meetings with multiple advisors. Um, and there, there are many things that they need to discuss. I think both sides should come away with it with something they can bring back to their domestic audiences, which is important both in the U.S. and Russia. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Angela. Is there by any chance that maybe going forward uh, that Joe Biden will want to follow uh, uh, Barack Obama's administration policy on the Russia reset? It was called then. Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Uh, is there any chance that uh, Joe Biden might want to look at that on the table and de-escalate tensions all over the world now? Biden has taken a tougher line on Russia than his predecessors, notably because of Russia's actions over the last several years in Ukraine and involving the Russian opposition, but also cyber security issues, uh, cyber attacks, and Russian interference in the U.S. elections. So I don't think there's... Um, a lot of room for uh, a great, great change. But again, the fact that they're having this meeting at all is very important, and really there's pretty much nowhere else they can go now but up. Anyway, in other words, you're saying, Angela, that we shouldn't expect any breakthrough or any hope of uh, progress in U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, but why the choice of Geneva, Switzerland? The meeting could have taken place anywhere else. Uh, why Geneva, Switzerland? Is there any symbolism to that? Well, first of all, Geneva is uh, long a historical place for negotiations. It's seen it's obviously Swiss neutrality is extremely important here. They're looking for neutral ground, not a place where either president has a leg up on the other. And there was a historic meeting here as well between Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan that was seen as an important moment in thawing ties between the U.S. and the Soviet Union it deep in the Cold War. About Ukraine, what chances is there of any kind of resolution where Ukraine is concerned, seeing as Ukraine has not yet been embraced by NATO and that Putin sees Ukraine as a red line that the U.S. must not cross? Ukraine is absolutely certain to come up in the discussions today. The chances of some sort of breakthrough on Ukraine are unlikely today. Uh, their sides, they're really on opposite sides of this situation. Um, the U.S. certainly wants to raise its concerns about Russian military buildup in the Ukraine area and, Ukra and Russia's actions in and around Ukraine over the last several years. But Russia sees Ukraine as its geopolitical backyard and considers that it's none of the America's business to be involved there. Right. Uh, two things. Number one will be cybersecurity. Uh, what will come up as regards that owing to the attacks on American companies recently, uh, colonial and the likes? And secondly, uh, Russians call him a dissident. He's stuck away in prison somewhere in the Russian Caucasus. 
uh, his case, you know, Russian frontline opposition leader, America is going to raise the case. That's Alexei Navalny. Uh, Alexei yes, Navalny. Biden's talking about certain. Alexei also, Navalny. Yeah. Yes, Biden is almost certain to raise the case of Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader who has been poisoned and jailed. Um, again, Russia sees this as none of America's business, so I'm not sure how much common ground they'll find on that subject. Cybersecurity, cyber attacks, another big issue. This is one the U.S. sees these as Russian orchestrated, targeting U.S. targets. Uh, Russia, Putin says this has nothing to do with the Russian government, and therefore there's, no, there's nothing for him to be considered guilty of. Again, an area of difficulty, but certainly one that has to come up today. This is, this is a major area of, uh, of really global security in the years to come, is cybersecurity. Well, I mean, this is uh, President Joe Biden's uh, first international trip since he assumed office as uh, American president. He has met uh, Putin before, but now they're meeting president to president. Uh, how is this likely to be different from uh, uh, President Donald Trump's meeting with uh, uh, with uh, President uh, Putin. And is it likely that there's going to be some discussion around COVID-19? Uh, President Biden is just coming from uh, the G7 meeting in uh, Cornwall, and uh, COVID-19 was a major issue there. If uh, Russia had not been expelled in 2014, when it was the G8, uh, President Putin would also have been at the table. Is there any possibility? Are you aware of any plans to also engage Russia at the level of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, resolutions at the G7 summit? Well, certainly on COVID-19, this is another area of potential common ground. This is a, a common enemy of the whole world, and they both, both leaders have talked about trying to find some areas of cooperation there. This might be around vaccine donations, uh, something that both presidents have talked about and used somewhat for, for political reasons as well. Um, to your question about uh, the comparison with Putin's meeting with Donald Trump, there's going to be a lot of attention to how, how this plays out. Obviously, that, that memorable meeting in Helsinki was at a very different time. Uh, it also involved Trump and Putin were, were alone together for a while, and there are things that we still don't know about that they discussed. And notably, they had a joint press conference in which Trump effectively sided with Putin in who denied that the Russians had anything to do with election interference in the U.S. Uh, Biden takes a very different stance on that, and uh, I don't think we will, we will see the same sort of um, body language and, and personal relations that you saw between, between Putin and Trump. Well, I think it's pretty safe to assume that Belarus or any conversation around Belarus will go the same way as Ukraine, with Putin feeling that's very much his territory. But what are the chances of... Biden securing a release for the two former U.S. Marines in Russian custody at the moment, even if it's a prison swap. This is something that both sides have hinted at. There is a possibility there could be progress on this. But again, both sides have also stressed the uh, low expectations. A lot will depend on how things go in these discussions and again on this personal rapport. For Biden, it's very important to establish these personal relations. And if that goes well, then maybe there'll be progress on some of these issues like prisoner swaps. Well, thank you so much for your time, Angela. Uh, for updates on COVID-19 pandemic, Adesua Mora is here with us. Adesua, great to have you. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. Uh, there's still a daily average of 10,000 coronavirus deaths globally. Uh, a situation the WHO boss talked about yesterday. Uh, the fatalities are not dropping as quickly as the infections. And uh, more than 600,000 people have now died from coronavirus in the United States. Uh, the U.S. has become the first country to pass that mark. This is even as more states in the country are now um, lifting there are remaining restrictions. If we could have the figures from the Johns Hopkins University, uh, over 3.8 million people have been killed by the virus, and well over 170, uh, seven, 76 million people have been infected. On the continent of Africa, there are also concerns over spiking cases as well as deaths as vaccination remains sluggish. More countries are imposing and enforcing strict curbing measures. South Africa had had to move to alert level three. Uh, President Cyril 
Ramaphosa addressing the nation yesterday night um, with restrictions on movement and gathering adjusted. We are also seeing strict enforcement of curbing measures in Uganda. Well, here in Nigeria, 17 new cases were recorded in Lagos, Rivers, and Gombe states in Nigeria. Uh, according to the NCDC data, no new COVID-related deaths were recorded in the country in the last 24 hours. And uh, talking about vaccination, now there was a press conference yesterday uh, where the executive director of the immunization agency in the country at the press conference, Dr. Faisal Shwaibu, made uh, um, said Nigeria is actually expecting nearly 4 million doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines by late July or early August. Of course, it's coming through the COVAX facility. You would recall that Nigeria has been rationing the 3.92 million doses it earlier received from the same facility in March. However, with the expected shipment, Dr. Schwaibu said yesterday that the country has decided to resume giving out first doses, uh, which had been halted to save its supply for a second doses. He says anyone who is 18 years and above can go to registered vaccination sites across the country to now get a first dose. Meanwhile, he urged those who have already received a first dose to go get their second shot on or before June 25th. Um, let me show you a map of the vaccination exercise so far for a first and second dose in Nigeria on your screen there. The country of about 200 million people has so far given a first dose to less than 2 million people, which is on your left, and fewer than 700,000 uh, second doses given, which is on your right. So we see that uh, even with the first shipment we've gotten from the COVAX facility, we are yet to exhaust those uh, um, uh, doses already. But it's good news that the vaccination has now been opened up to 18 and above. Uh, elsewhere, out of Nigeria, just as Governor Anthony Cuomo of New York declared that the state would immediately ease many of its remaining restrictions due uh, to 70% of adults re receiving at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, it has now emerged that nearly 900 of those people received an expired jab at a vaccination site in Times Square this month. Uh, 899 people received doses of Pfizer vaccine expired at the former NFL experience building in Times Square between the 5th of June and 10th of June, and they have not been asked to come for a replacement shot. Authorities say, say that there are no health risks associated with the batch in question. And finally, still in the US, researchers have now found that more evidence shows coronavirus was circulating at low levels across the United States as early as December 2019, and that's weeks before the first officially reported case in the US. Now, frozen blood samples indicate that people in five states, including Illinois, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, and Massachusetts, were infected with coronavirus days or weeks before any case were officially reported in any of those five states. Uh, the study was conducted by the National Institute of Health in the US. Well, first, uh that, uh, let's start with that last report that you're referring to, mm -hmm. which is uh, published uh, online in the, uh, in the Journal of uh, Infectious Diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, those uh, researchers who took a look at about 24,000 uh, Americans. Yes. And what they discovered was that, in fact, the uh, virus had already uh, you know, showed up in the United States uh, as early as the middle of December. But their report did not indicate whether those persons traveled or not. But it established that at least seven of the participants were nowhere near New York or Seattle where, you know, the first wave was recorded in the United States. But the big question that that research has raised now uh, is the question, how did this virus happen? How did it get into the United States? And the question remains that, look, Internationally, the WHO and other stakeholders uh, are still trying to establish what indeed is the origin of this virus. Mm -hmm. And that is in concert with uh, you know, the position of the World Health Organization and also of the uh, G7 at the uh, summit that they held, uh, you know, the just concluded summit in Cornwall uh, in southwestern United Kingdom, mm -hmm. about the need for you know, leaders to cooperate more, to collaborate more, for countries to share information, to share intelligence, mm -hmm. in order to know, one, how this particular pandemic occurred, 
what the exact origin is. Is it animal to human? Is it uh, you know something that escaped from a uh, from a laboratory? So that in the future, you know, countries can be more proactive, and the level of preparedness, pandemic preparedness, you know, uh, can uh, be raised. Now, as for the uh, Nigerian government giving an update, I think it was uh, good or is good that Dr. Fisa Shayib, the man in charge of the uh, uh, primary healthcare development agency is giving regular updates. Now, but all of us must note that beyond all the things he said, the curfew is still in place. He's still advising physical and social distancing. He's also still saying that indoor gatherings must not exceed 50, and that whatever efforts the Nigerian government may have made, uh, people should still observe those non-pharmaceutical interventions including the fact that the Nigerian government has placed restrictions on people coming from high-risk countries yes. who are on arrival must say quarantine. There was a reference to donations mm. uh, in that his, uh, speech. He was commending the G7, mm -hmm. and particularly the US, for promising 500 million uh, doses. Mm -hmm. He was also commending the, uh, uh, the MasterCard Foundation, yes. which has promised to make about $1.3 billion available uh, to the African Center for Disease Control to get uh, vaccines. Well, I don't think Nigeria's concentration should be on uh, donations and doing long truth for donations. What strategy do we have in place in Nigeria to get our own vaccines? The next batch of vaccines that he says will come uh, before uh, 12 weeks, you know, th those vaccines will also come from uh, the COVAX facility. Mm -hmm. What are our plans? What is the national immunization strategy? Yes, we have immunized over 1 million people out of the doses uh, for first dose. We have immunized over 600,000 for second dose, right? From yes. the donations that we got. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the plan to get more, to ramp it up? At a point, Israel was doing overnight immunization, mm -hmm. 24 hours. They were immunizing their people. Look at even the example of the United Kingdom. We are not learning the appropriate lessons from other places. Good news, he also recommended the AstraZeneca Oswald vaccine, which he says is very resilient against the B.1.617 uh, Delta variant yes. that originated uh, from uh, India. India. And he urged Nigerians who have taken the first dose to take a look at, their, at, their, at the certificates they were given to make sure that they take the second dose. I like the fact that Dr. Faisal Shaib is communicating with us, but there are many questions that will still have to be addressed in terms of the national vaccination strategy. And the numbers in Nigeria keep going down. The other day you said we recorded six infection rates mm -hmm. all over the country. Yes. Today I think you mentioned 17 yes. in the last 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Is it that we are no longer testing? Mm -hmm. You know, because all of a sudden the, the data uh, from both uh, the NCDC yes. and the uh, MPACD uh, is showing, is giving the impression that uh, maybe coronavirus has disappeared from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And that contradicts you know, the kind of advice uh, that Dr. Shaib was giving yesterday in his press briefing. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to that report you shared at this about the expired vaccines that were given in New York yes. and the advice from the New York City um, Health Department that those people have been contacted, they've been emailed and what have you, mm -hmm. and they should just come back and take another jab. So yes. what are we supposed to learn from this? That an expired vaccine is just ineffective, it doesn't harm you? Well, uh, to, new, to the best of my knowledge, that's what the authorities are trying to say uh, when they say there is no health risk associated with this. However, we know that for some vaccines, including the Johnson & Johnson and the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the shelf life have been extended by health authorities after a review. But we haven't heard anything about the Pfizer vaccine, which is the vaccine in this instance. Uh, if the shelf life was extended by authorities, perhaps that's why they are saying there are no health risks. But this where expired vaccines, uh, it's not so clear what the message is and why there are no health risks associated with an expired uh, COVID-19 vaccine. All right. Thank you so much for that as well. But really, I want to go back and hop on the discovery or the needs to know where all of this started from. Yes. And the truth is, and I always go back and make this long quote about the Wuhan lab. Uh, and I keep saying that the Deputy National Security Advisor in America can't be wrong mm. in saying that something came out of the lab and he told that to Trump in a security briefing. Mm -hmm. Bob Woodward put it in his book. 
It can't be wrong. And now there are copious evidence that there was an accident that did happen in the Wuhan lab. The Wuhan lab was set up as a joint partnership between France and China. But the Chinese people kicked France out of it, and the Chinese have been rolling this full on. Mm -hmm. And there are copious evidence now that they did carry out experiments on bats, thousands of bat species there. We've got, also got evidence that at a point, they did, delete, they did delete the glossary of the kind of bats they had in the lab off their website. Mm. These things are there. And we need to come clean. And also, the email exchanges here and there. You also recall that um, scientists who work in that lab, we have reports that they also came down with um, with, with, this thing, yes, with this thing, with infections. So if it, if it, if it, and and from time immemorial, we always see diseases that come out of the lab. I'm sure if you remember the the Marburg incident in Germany mm. in '76 or thereabout, they they had a, a virus they were working on out of monkeys, mm. and it jumped out of the lab and it affected a lot of people. So we've always seen things like this, and they should just come clean and tell us the truth. What? This is back and forth. Oh, we're also oh. counting down to the intelligence community reports yeah. in the U.S. to well, see what the they should with. tell us the, the truth. Thing to note is that the WHO mm -hmm. uh, that sent experts to uh, Wuhan, uh, the experts even came forward to say, you know, their their, their findings are not conclusive enough. Yes. And I think it's on the basis of that that the G7, you know, at its um, just concluded meeting, decided that there should be an expert-led WHO supervised uh, mm -hmm. review. Yeah. As for the incident uh, with ATS vaccination services in New York, yes. uh, that's a contractor company mm -hmm. that was helping New York to uh, vaccinate people. I think it's good. There are lessons we can learn from there mm. because the people have been traced, they've been informed, and they've been told that the expired vaccines will not affect them mm -hmm. in any way whatsoever. Transparency. They, 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 yeah, the point is about transparency. Mm -hmm. It's about documentation. Yes. If you were to be given an expired vaccine in Nigeria, nobody probably knows where you live. Mm -hmm. But the good news yes, is that they do. it they won't affect all you. your information, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Where can they track you? Can yes, they track they you? Can. We can't track Unless and trace. Unless you lie. Unless you lie. Unless you lie. Unless you Before you get a vaccine in Nigeria at the moment, you have to register yes. with your address, yes. your number. Yes. Yes. You, you know, so you probably, uh, you probably uh, will be traced. You know the problem with addresses in Nigeria. Uh, uh, <laughs> I just well, have you tried finding a street address before Google Maps in this country? <laughs> they have your phone number too. We're not that bad. Not Some of those phone numbers are fake. Yeah, let's people lie. So they can track you. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank you.